Jazzcast Pros. Welcome to Living the Front Seat Life podcast, sponsored by BIPOC Peak, breaking the stigma, breaking the silence. And it is going to be an incredible time in Rochester, Buffalo, and in Syracuse as we dive into mental health for communities of color. July is National Mental Health Awareness Month. And so um, Sarah Taylor, the founder of Partners in Community Development and the BIPOC Peak Project has brought together an incredible group of speakers. I am one, I will be speaking in Rochester on July 13th. Register for this incredible conference today at BIPOCParentVoice.org. Welcome to Living the Front Seat Life. I'm your host, Kelly Marie, and I invite you to take this journey with me. We're going to be talking about all things mental health and emotional well-being. You see, I am a overcomer. If you are interested in figuring out the path for you to determine how and where you will drive your future, this is the place to be. We get to determine the ride. We may not get to determine the weather or who's on the road with us or if it's going to be a scenic route or not, but we are the drivers. So join me on this ride, living the front seat life. It is your host, Coach Kelly Marie, and today I have a guest with me who is a leader in her field. We are going to be talking about mental health, trauma, the trauma response, and bringing in you know some of the healing process that will be happening in Buffalo, New York after the Tops May 14th massacre. Our guest will be a speaker at the July symposiums that are being held by BIPOC Peak Partners in Community Development. So with me today, and I think that you will really enjoy our conversation, is Dr. Anel Prim. Dr. Prim is a Baltimore-based community psychiatrist who serves as Senior Medical Director of the Steve Fund. Now, the Steve Fund is an organization focused on the mental health of young people of color. Dr. Prem is also co-founder, chair, and convener of All Healers Mental Health Alliance. Now, that's a national network of mental health professionals, advocates, academics, first responders, and faith community leaders, which facilitates culturally grounded responses to the mental health needs of Black and other marginalized communities affected by disasters, both natural and human caused. Welcome, Dr. Prim, and thank you for joining me today. Can you just tell people what brought you to this work? Well, first of all, Kelly, thank you for having me. What brought me to this work, um, well, I'm a community psychiatrist, and Mm -hmm. I've been doing this work for over 40 years. Being a physician, you know, you're you're taught mainly to do, you know, one-on-one, you know, um, one quote unquote, patient at a time providing services. But public health is also a part of my background. And with the community psychiatry focused mixed with that, I've come to see the importance of looking at the whole community. And so really thinking about populations and what populations need. And so um, my experiences in Baltimore really prepared me to continue being conscious of what people in communities need, being focused on not always expecting them to come to you, to, to come to me, but you know me and others who are in the mental health and related human service professions have to go to where the people are and also to just be cognizant of what people say they need and want. And so I've just been drawn to that work. You know, my family members uh, we're also in the helping professions, and I think that was an important foundation for me and in terms of how you serve communities. And um, as far as disasters are concerned, colleagues of mine and I were just so devastated after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And 
you know, we were seeing things on television, um, seeing our people suffering under the worst conditions and dying. And we felt like we needed to do something, but we knew we couldn't drop everything and go running to the Gulf Coast and, and New Orleans and places like that. So we decided to figure out another way to be helpful. And that's how the organization uh, that I lead called the All Healers Mental Health Alliance, that's how it came into being um, out of that need to do something, even if uh, at a distance from afar, we figured out ways to come together with other like-minded people to serve communities and to support their mental health and well-being and thriving in the aftermath of disasters. That's a long answer to your question. No, but it it's perfect. And so you being a psychiatrist, you went to medical school and medical school is a very traditional Western medicine, you know, focus. How were you able to bridge between, you know, the medical model and developing the All Healers Mental Health Alliance? Because that's inclusive of of all different types of, of mental health workers. I was fortunate uh, to attend Howard University Medical School. And I feel that the medical education I received there was very unique, very special, because it wasn't just the quote unquote medical model, but it was very socially conscious. And, you know, I can remember one of my professors, the late Dr. Josephine Green, uh, she was a she was uh, the head of family medicine at Howard, and she had us as medical students go out and do home visits and community visits. And so uh, I think, you know, that was a part of, of my education as well, um, of recognizing that if you're going to be a good physician, you you have to see how people live. And in helping to problem solve with people to improve their health and well-being, you need to know what the environment is like and what are some of the factors that may be getting in the way of their optimal health and well-being. And so um, in dealing with disasters um, and kind of carrying over um, from that experience, um, you know, I guess it, it, there's there's two sides to it. Yes, I'm a psychiatrist and I treat mental illnesses, but I also need to be conscious of what mental health is, of promoting mental health, of preventing mental illness whenever possible, which means, you know, finding ways to intervene when people and, and communities are exposed to certain risk factors. And there's a saying that uh, former Surgeon General Dr. David Satcher and the late Dr. Carl Bell, one of my psychiatry colleagues, uh, have always said risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. And so that basically means that many of us are exposed to risks all the time um, that could take us down the path of, of having mental health concerns or even a mental illness. But we could interrupt that cycle and utilize protective factors. Putting protective factors in place can keep someone well or, or you know, really serve as a buffer against some of those risk factors that that we experience. I'll give you an example. Young people, uh, children uh, who may have experienced, you know, what they call adverse childhood experiences, various types of, of trauma. Those traumas and, and uh, those ACEs, as they call them, can create toxic stress. And one of the antidotes for toxic stress is having a caring adult. It doesn't have to be a family member or a parent. It could be a teacher or a coach or a family friend or other relative uh, that shows unconditional love to that young person. That can be a buffer. And I would say those are examples of protective factors, you know, the adult protective shield and that unconditional love. And that's a kind of environment to uh, surround a child with in general, but also uh, in particular among 
young people who may have experienced, you know, some type of trauma. And so by putting into place that adult protective shield and that unconditional love, we can buffer against the risks associated with um, those types of traumas, which if you have multiple traumas, it can increase the risk of in adulthood having mental illness and uh, substance use and, and physical problems as well. So I just offer that as an example. Um, it's not only about treating mental illness, but it's also about working hand in hand with communities, with the communities driving the conversation and identifying the priorities and creating environments in which, which people can experience mental health, which, you know, by definition is the ability to adapt to change and cope with stress. And one of the things that we have done in communities that have been affected by disasters is to share with people techniques for relaxation to ward off the stress that is, you know, so much a part of disasters. And so by teaching people breathing techniques and relaxation exercises, this can be a tool that they can use themselves and that they can share with others uh, to help reduce some of the stress that may accompany the disasters and, and other tragedies that they may experience. So, you know, that's just an example of the one of the ways in which we uh, have sought to facilitate culturally grounded, culturally affirming approaches to healing in the aftermath of disasters. Anyone listening to the podcast has heard the previous episodes and I've spoken about the massacre in Buffalo at Topps Market and the need for the community to heal. But how do communities and the Black community, how do we get past this notion of not claiming mental illness, not needing to address mental health, um, not needing to ask for help, believing that, you know, Black don't crack? How do you get past these barriers and myths uh, that the community holds and holds so, so close to the chest? normalize, and I don't really like that word normal, but to naturalize, to make it natural to experience hurt and to be able to talk about it. You know, I agree that we in, in the African-American community are often taught to be stoic and there's a high value placed on that, you know, for us to be able to keep on keeping on and withstand uh, all sorts of, of hardship and adversities. But as humans, you know, we, we have emotions. We experience pain and hurt and loss and grief. And all of those things can be helped by sharing. I mean, as humans, we're relational creatures. We, we need each other. We need to be together. And I think the, the massacre in, in Buffalo is a perfect example of a situation in which we we need to come together. The healing takes place uh, through interaction and and closeness and and togetherness and collaboration. And that's exactly what has begun to happen already. Uh, that people are coming together in healing circles, and some have you know utilized their faith community. Uh, as a way of of healing together, and I mean, when you think about um, what the COVID nineteen pandemic did, it it kept us from each other. You know, people talked about quote unquote social isolation, which many of us in the mental health community advised against using that language because I mean, we might need to be physically distanced, but we did hopefully all of us found ways of still being socially connected, finding other ways to, you know, communicate and be in community with each other, even though we might not always be able to be in person and very close to each other like we're used to. Because of just the human nature of suffering, I mean, it, this is 
common, you know, across the world, across people of all different backgrounds. We, like other humans, um, need to be conscious that when we are hurting, we do need to come together. We do need to share. We do need to unload our burdens. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is healthy and cleansing and helps us be on track, you know, to heal and thrive even in the midst of tragedy. I appreciate that so much. You spoke about um, different ways of healing. And one of the things you mentioned was healing circles. Can you just talk about what a healing circle is, how it works? I know this is a term that a lot of people have heard lately, but may not know what to experience or, or may not know what to expect and may therefore not participate because they don't have the information that they need to make a decision on whether or not it's, it's something for them. You know, healing circles are essentially support groups in which people with something in common, you know, their support groups for breast cancer, even addictions, where people come together, they share their stories, they listen to each other, um, they give support to each other in their listening. They share uh, strategies for how to cope with whatever challenges they might face. And, and it really helps people know that they're not alone. And here we are going back to that, you know, the importance of connection. And so in a healing circle designed for the tragedy that just occurred in, in Buffalo, such a healing circle would give people a space, a safe space where they can feel comfortable talking about their thoughts, their feelings, their fears, their concerns, you know, their anger uh, about the way that this racially ex extremist event, that the impact that it is having on the Buffalo community, you know, and specific individuals who were lost, you know, the grieving, it, it really provides a space for you know, conversation and discussion about all of those emotions, you know, the historical background leading to this, because these sorts of tragedies, you know, they're not happening in a vacuum and they're not new. And so the healing circles are a space to, to get all of that out, you know, for that sharing. And in that sharing, there's a lot of learning that takes place and having that shared kind of understanding and appreciation of, of what our people have gone through and what we need to do together, you know, to, to move forward, you know, to heal and to be a whole community and to be prepared for what faces us in the future as we go forward and just to be solidify our convictions that we're going to work together to do whatever we can by any means necessary to just to protect ourselves and strengthen ourselves for the future, for our families, our children, our, our communities. Thanks. So I want to just switch gears a little bit and talk about the event that Sarah Taylor has coming up in July. So July 13th, 14th, and 16th, she has mental health symposiums or conferences being held in Rochester, Buffalo, and Syracuse. Why is it important for white professionals to attend and get the type of learning that you received through conferences like this? They're going to hear from, from experts and peers and leaders um, just the reality of what Black people, the Black community experiences. And, you know, it's very important for mental health professionals, no matter what their background, to be able to have knowledge about the types of environments that people are living in, uh, the, the social determinants of health that they confront, um, for them to learn how to be a part of the solution to be able to identify resources and services that are helpful and acceptable to members of the Black community, and also to develop a posture of 
cultural humility. That's such a, a critically important aspect of service uh, to communities that are different than your own. To have a mindset of wanting to to learn, you know, asking the important questions. And so the conference will provide that type of educational setting where white professionals will come away with information maybe they hadn't had before that really ground the experience of African Americans, especially in the aftermath of the Buffalo shooting, just recognizing the ways in which systemic racism influences so many aspects of uh, the lives of of African Americans and, and other other people of color. So it's an excellent learning opportunity and it's not a one-shot deal <laughs> this is this type of learning is ongoing it's not a, a destination uh, you know to be quote unquote culturally competent I don't even like to use that term because it, it suggests that you know you've reached a destination and they have some sort of certificate but it's really uh, active ongoing and and hopefully uh, attending, uh, the symposia will whet the appetite of the attendees, you know, to continue their learning process. I appreciate that perspective so much. You know, I personally struggle when, uh, you know, I'm just a straightforward person and just tell people, listen, you need to be there. Just because black faces are on the flyer doesn't mean that white people aren't supposed to come. And, you know, I get that like kind of sideways, huh? I don't understand what you mean. But that's been the response. You know, organizations will send their diversity, equity, inclusion person, or they'll only, you know, circulate it around their black staff. And it's more than just the black staff members that need to participate. Um, so thank you for putting that in such a way that <laughs> is, is probably more um, palpable to, to people to, to receive. Now, one of the things that I've noticed is in this time of healing that many first responders, many therapists, um, psychologists, mental health workers may not be taking care of themselves because they're still taking care of the community. Can you speak to their need to practice self-care and awareness and all of the things that they're teaching other people? Yes, that's very important. And actually, that's one of the primary principles of the All Healers Mental Health Alliance And that is care for the caregiver. You know, sometimes when we're dealing with disasters, um, we're dealing with first responders who themselves uh, may have had losses due to the disaster or their family members may have been affected and they have to put all of that aside and, you know, go running to the front lines um, to assist others. And so we encourage, you know, at the end of our, meetings, we remind everyone, you know, we, we applaud them for their contributions uh, to the community and their dedication. And at the same time, we remind them to also pay attention to their own mental health and well-being, because if they, you know, are feeling broken or overwhelmed or burnt out, uh, it will be difficult for them to continue you know, to to give at the level that they give uh, in their service uh, to to communities. So that is really a a critical piece. And, you know, when you think about it, as people are engaging individuals who um, have been affected by a crisis like the Buffalo shooting, they're going to be listening, listening to all sorts of stories and about losses and just tragic things and they're they're hearing that day after day hour after hour and um it can become overwhelming and so finding a way to counterbalance that you know it's a part of their job to do that listening and they have the skills to assist people and hopefully they will have the opportunity to see the people that they're serving you know gain ground and be on their way uh, to to healing that's rewarding that's very gratifying but at the same time people need to be very intentional and deliberate about 
carving out the time, making the time for themselves, you know, to get adequate rest, you know, to eat properly, you know, to get some sort of physical activity, to get some sunshine. These are all basic things to drink water. And sometimes we forget to drink enough water and end up with headaches, you know, compounded by, you know, all of the trials and tribulations of what people are going through after they've listened to all of that. They sometimes call that the vicarious trauma that the uh, helpers may internalize. So this is just a part of, of good mental hygiene or wellness hygiene to prevent a breakdown by being conscious of, you know, continuing to replenish and recognize that taking that time out for yourself, it's, it's not selfish. It's really self-sustaining and therefore essential. Incredible. Um, before we close, I'd like to just kind of go full circle and, and, touch back on a point you made earlier around mental health. If you could close us out with some signs and symptoms that people should be personally looking out for as they're healing, um, as they are going through this process, uh, figuring out their, their healing journey, what should they be looking for by way of needing to ask for help? When does someone know that it's time to ask for help. We all, from time to time, experience sadness or anxiety or worry. Um, but sometimes that sadness or depression or anxiety can increase to the point that it interferes with our functioning. And, you know, the actual definition of a mental illness is a condition that involves our thoughts, our emotions, and our behavior, or a combination of all three that causes impairment in our, our functioning, you know, whether we are functioning in roles as a, a parent, a spouse, a student, a caregiver, uh, an employee, whatever our role is. Um, once those symptoms, whatever they are, start to interfere with our functioning, that's usually a tip off that we need to get help. You know, if you can't sleep, you know, for days on end, or you get so very little sleep that you can't function, you can't think, you know, you have trouble making decisions. And, you know, in, in some, the work that some people do, decision-making is an important aspect of their job. You know, when a student can't study their lessons, you know, where their anxiety is so great that they're avoiding things that they're required to do, like go to school, for instance. Once a person becomes out of touch with reality, uh, where they begin having what we call fixed false beliefs, delusions, these are all examples of when it's time to seek help. And I'm making it sound perhaps very severe, but you know, not eating enough and losing weight, you know, not getting appropriate nourishment or overeating to the point that a person becomes ill. And of course, you know, when, when people are feeling bad about themselves, even having thoughts of, of death or, or suicide, and uh, we'll need to make sure to provide the, the suicide hotline before we end. But um, these are all examples. And, and there's some hidden signs of, of stress and mental health concerns that some people are not really aware of. For instance, grinding their teeth, which can be very, very detrimental to dental health. That's one way that stress comes out, one of the hidden ways. You know, high blood pressure, which if people don't get their high blood pressure checked, they might not even know. And, and we know that high blood pressure can be a silent killer. You know, it can lead to stroke and so many other health conditions. And then, you know, when our mental health leads us uh, to do things in excess, like using alcohol or other drugs, which then adds on another problem, or eating to excess, which can increase risk for diabetes and heart disease and so forth. So just watching these extremes and, and watching one's functioning are critical things to keep in mind um, to help determine when it's time to get help. 
you know, the, the DSM-5, and now it's on uh, a text revision, and the DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the book that classifies the different types of, of mental illness. You know, for depression, they usually say if people have five or more symptoms in their list um, for a two-week period, you know, happening more often than not, you know, most days in that two-week period, that's often a sign that people need to get help. But I, I wanted to share some other maybe more practical ways of thinking about when you need to get help. Because when you stop being able to function in the roles that, you know, are assigned to you or the roles that you have chosen, that really may need be the time to get some help. Because if you can't function, I mean, that can have disastrous consequences for yourself and, and the individuals that depend on you. If you're a parent and you have children, if you can't function, the children are going to be affected. And so uh, that may really drive the need for you to seek help, um, you know, sooner rather than later. Don't suffer in silence and just, you know, wish and hope that it'll go away. Uh, it's better to, to seek help, even if it's from your primary care physician. Not everyone knows where to go, you know, for mental, mental health services, but many family physicians and nurse practitioners, physician's assistants and others uh, are prepared to do a screening for depression or anxiety and help people um, come to the reality that they need some additional support, uh, whether that comes in the form of psychotherapy or medication or whatever is appropriate for that individual. Um, there are you know, lots of, of resources out there uh, for mental health support and service. Thank you so much. The, those practical pieces, I think, are, are often missed. You know, you get uh, the general, if you're sleeping too much or not sleeping enough, you know, signs and, and symptoms. But thank you for adding that to the list of things to be watchful of. And I want to make sure that we give everyone um, the, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. Um, it's 1-800-273-8255. Please call if you need someone to talk to. I often, Dr. Prem, you know, tell people save the number in their phones and save it as pizza delivery man. If you don't want to save it because somebody might be in your phone or in your business, just save the number so that you have it. So it's not something you have to look for. You never know when you may need it or you may need it for a loved one. So that number again is one 800 273 8255. Please save the number and please feel free to use it for yourself or for a loved one um, if you're ever in need or in crisis. Dr. Prim, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been truly a pleasure to speak with you, you know, to hear your words of wisdom and expertise. And thank you for being an asset to the Buffalo community. It's greatly needed and your voice is heard. And I'd love to see you, uh, you know, in, in the boxes um, when we are online in the meetings, knowing that you're there really eases my stress to know that you and people like Dr. Lewis are available for the Buffalo community. Um, it's been my pleasure, you know, to get to know you and other leaders like Sarah Taylor, Dr. Ma'at Lewis, Sophia Rice, and so many others that I have met, uh, Kelly Dumas and so forth. Uh, it's been quite an amazing experience to be able to join with you all in, in supporting your community. And there are many buffaloes all over the nation. And, and I'm very conscious that this could have happened anywhere, even here in Baltimore, and so this is an opportunity for us to learn how we need to be there for each other, you know, for the long haul. This is going to be a long-term uh, long work that we need to engage in collaboratively. And what has happened in Buffalo is really a very good example of, of how we need to do it going forward. So thank you again for this opportunity and, and for your excellent leadership. 
Thank you so very much. And thank you for listening. You have been listening to Living the Front Seat Life podcast. I am your host, Coach Kelly Marie, and my guest, Dr. Prim, has been here going over um, some things that we haven't really talked about before, naturalizing the the um, feelings of pain and hurt and making it a, a natural process for us to go through. We talked about healing circles and what those mean and how to recognize signs and symptoms of emotional and mental health health distress, um, and why everyone, no matter who you are or no matter your background, should attend the conference that Sarah Taylor is presenting this July, July 13th, 14th, and 16th. Please head over to the website to register today at BIPOCParentVoice.org. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast. If you're getting something out of it, I know that someone else will too. And, uh, you know, don't keep all this goodness to yourself. So send it to a friend, send it to a family member, um, post it up on your timeline. Let people know that they should be living and listening to Living the Front Seat Life podcast. Until the next time, be the light.